My name is Nelson Kwaje. I'm a, I'm a South Sudanese. Yeah. Um, I was born in the then Sudan, one Sudan, uh, in the early 90s. Um, so I was born in Sudan, it was one country, but I was born in the north part of the Sudan, which is now Sudan. Which is, uh, I was born in Khartoum, in the outskirts of Khartoum actually, uh, in a small slum that has been, uh, it, it was later on demolished, <laughs> because it was an informal settlement. Um, I was born there because my, um, my, both my parents had fled the south, where our ancestral homeland is. Uh, prior to that, I think my dad would left in the um, in the early 70s, in the late 70s, and so is my mom, because of the war. Because the majority of the war was intensified. The war was very intense in the south, but the north was uh, relatively calm. So they both went there, and as a result, if you're coming as an internally displaced person, you have to sandwich yourself on the lowest tier of the economy. <laughs> so yeah, that's how both my parents ended up in this, in this small slum <laughs> and, I was, uh, and I was born there. So and then I grew up in Sudan. I grew up very much Sudanese, uh, like I did everything that intended for me to be Sudanese and to, be, uh, to, to grow up in this predominantly Islamic Arab part of the country. And yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of very much my formative years. I did my primary school there. Um, but also as we kind of progressed, um, it's, it's my dad had, um, my dad didn't finish university, but he was very smart. So he got jobs with NGOs and what. So as time progressed with the early 90s, mid 90s, uh, as time unfolded, we, our family basically like danced up and down the poverty line <laughs> throughout that time. Uh, <laughs> Slightly up, slightly down, slightly up, but like by the late 90s, we kind of like, I think I can say like my dad kind of established some form of a, a decent life. And then so it kind of grew up there. By the time I reached high school, I was taken to a private school, did my high school in Sudan, finished high school, started university there, I started uh, studying architecture out of all things. Did it for one year, then the country split in 2011. And then I uh, had to come back to this, <laughs> which was the, what was the southern part of Sudan, now the South Sudan country. Um, yeah, and, and I did, I did um, so after I came back, I did, I came back after doing my first year of architecture, and I came back to South Sudan very delusional, like, very, very energetic, very delusional, wrapped up in this mix of identity and languages. I, I am South Sudanese by ethnicity and, uh, and everything, but I've never grow, I, I never spent time in South Sudan. Spent time in Khartoum, speaking Arabic. Um, I did, yeah, speaking Arabic and living as a Sudanese, adopting the culture there, so came back to South Sudan thinking about all these things, then I dropped out of school. So I dropped out of school in 2011, just as we, um, I did my first year of architecture, dropped out of school and spent one year doing casual work. So I worked as a welder, which is very interesting. I can weld, that's, <laughs> I dropped it out of, that is a skill that I, I had to remove from my CV, I think like two years ago or a year ago, because it was no longer over there, yeah. So I worked in South Sudan for like one year, doing welding and doing casual work. Yeah, but in the process also just trying to rediscover what I want to do. And then, and then afterwards I came to Kenya for my, to study and do an undergraduate, an undergraduate program in IT. So that's, it's kind of in a nutshell, that's how I ended up here in this country. It was interesting. I went to a public school. I, I, uh, I joined the Technical University of Kenya, which is um, a lot of foreign students go to private schools, um, especially South Sudanese. Uh, I mean, um, a lot of us are in, the, you find South Sudanese at, at the other universities, Strathmore and the ZTEX and whatever. So I went to the Technical University of Kenya and I was the only one, the only South Sudanese in the department 
and I was the only South Sudanese in my class. Um, so it was uh, very difficult and it, it was very, the, the school wasn't difficult, but for me fitting in was very difficult at the start. I recall I arrived, I arrived in Kenya um, like uh, one month after the school had started already. Showed up late and I had to catch up with scout in school, with classes and what. My first day in school, I walked, I kind of, someone uh, took me to school from South B. On my way back, I got lost. <laughs> I got lost on my way back from Technical University of Kenya to South B. And then just trying to figure out. So it was difficult trying to adopt into the, the, uh, the Kenyan culture. Things are very fast. The culture is extreme. I grew up in Sudan, which is like a very conservative, I grew up in North Sudan, a very conservative Islamic culture. And I came to, to, to Kenya and the Technical University of Kenya. The culture is extremely liberal. I walked into the school, I saw ladies sitting on people's laps. <laughs> I, was, I was like, I was like, in the university, I saw ladies sitting on, on, on gentlemen's laps. Um, other people, in, you go to some places, you see some people like displaying public affection. So it was, for me it was like, I was like, I found the university extremely liberal, um, more than I, <laughs> I had experienced there. Uh, but the studies were good. Uh, the studies were really good and like, and the Technical University of Kenya is really technical. They, they, we were in the lab, we had to do what, so that helped me. And it's a tough university. Like we don't have a, when our, our space, the, the university, the land is very small. We're not like UN or what, we have a lot of campus. We have, uh, we have one campus. The, the hostel can only accommodate, I don't know, 500 or 1,000 students. The rest of us have to kind of squat around railways, land Maui and what. So that toughness really, it, 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 makes, it makes you a real ninja. Yeah, so by the time I finished college, and that's like, as I, was, as I was doing my university, by the time I finished college is that South Sudan has already erupted and engulfed in its civil war, which was started in the late 20, 2013, and then like intensified again in 20, yeah, it started in 20, 2013, yeah, and I finished university by, by around May or April 2015, which was like not long time ago, but by the time I finished, yeah, the country was really messed up and the prospects for it was like really there. And I was here in Kenya. Uh, the other thing also that really, that really um, angered me is that I was here in Kenya, but I don't want to say this without sounding A-modest, but I was really good at what I do. <laughs> yeah, I, you know what, let me sound A-modest. <laughs> um, I was really good. Like, like I, because I came from South Sudan, while I was in school, I really wanted because I was that guy from South Sudan, I didn't want, like I didn't want my South sudanese to be associated with, um, with lack of excellence. So by the second year, I, sp I, I, I could spend like about four to six hours in the library at times because I was doing evening classes. So I'll spend the whole day in the library. I study like crazy. By the time I was, I was in the second year, I was so good at my like classes, but I, was, I had already got a Cisco certifications. Like I, I studied online and I got an international certifications in networking. Um, and my classmates know, know a little about that. So I was really good, I was pretty good. And I started actually in my, in my third year, I started earning for some classmates say like, has a side business, they do for me a website. I remember I did one for them and I, like, I was paid like 4K or 6K. This was really good money <laughs> for a student. I remember I bought, I went and bought a Timberland shoes <laughs> with that. Um, yeah, but like, I was really good. And then I finished school, I go for this internship. And then I, I'm in this, doing internship in this hospital. I, I don't want to mention the name of it, but like it's a big hospital here. Like I'm, I'm really good qualified. Then I'm, we're like 10 interns and everyone wants to Everyone wants to please the bosses, the IT bosses, so that they can be absorbed, whatever that is. Um, I mean, I recall incidents where the IT manager would walk and say like, who will bring me tea? And about, ten, about three interns would run, <laughs> run to do that. And I was a Cisco certified network associate. Like I, I, I was nowhere less qualified than even the people who are doing the things. 
I just realized like this employment thing is really messed up and it's, I don't want to play for favoritism and what. So I, as I was doing my internship, I created, I just used one of the computers to create a logo for this thing called Web for All. And I, that's when I met my, my co-founder Dan, who was with me in school, and we were like, hey, let's try to do, let's try to do web development. And I set up, um, I found a way of setting up or buying a server and then setting up uh, a, a space and I started giving people hosting and started developing websites on CMSs and then using what. Um, and then that, by that time, I reached, reached a place where like, I reached a place where I was able to make enough money not to ask cash from my dad. Um, and that was, so it was kind of out of necessity, but then I just realized like, you know what, let's try to make it here. I remember we used to, I used to tell Dan to go from, we used to actually do marketing, old school marketing, like really go door to door and knock, <laughs> knock on people's, uh, knock, go to churches, go to whatever, say like, hey, we do this service, whatever, can you, we do this service, can you do, very aggressive. Um, and that is, and that is how I, I, I started Web4, and that led me, into doing a lot of also businesses in South Sudan for, 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 for many uh, non-profits. So I was able to connect, as much as I was not in South Sudan, I was able to do services here, but also connected back to South Sudan. Yeah, I think, I think like here in Kenya, it's, it's Kenya like has, it has, it's a very competitive market. That's one thing I can say for sure. And as a young person, you really need to be serious. Um, you need to both, you need to be serious, but also you need to be perceived as serious. And I usually say those are two things. Um, you can be serious, but then people don't perceive you as serious. If people doubt your seriousness or that, because like here in Kenya, if you're a young person, most of the time when you walk in, I usually say as a young person, you, you're deemed unqualified con man until you prove, until you extremely prove otherwise. <laughs> if you're an elderly gentleman and you're wearing a suit and you whatever you have a little bit of age, you're deemed qualified until you go and mess up. But as a young person from the start, people are suspecting your credibility, your professionalism, uh, your integrity. So all those things are the question from the door. So you really, as a young person, you need to ensure that you work extra hard to kind of remove these perceptions. And the way you do that, the best marketing is to do good work. Like really, I, I find a lot of people miss the point. They want the best marketing you can do even for events or for whatever. Just do good work, do it well. That, that, that is good. That is, that is sufficient enough to, to get referrals and to get some. So like we spend a lot of our time, even I remember uh, at the start and even up to now, there are a lot of projects that we do at times. I tell the team, um, let's spend an extra money on this project so that we just have an output. Huh? that can make the client satisfied so that they can come for the second thing. And then I also tell the team not to be in a rush. Um, don't, 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 don't be in a rush, don't sound desperate. Try to hold your ground. Really, you need to understand power. As a young person, you really need to understand power and how it manifests. If you, if you don't understand how these power dynamics work, you might lose your bargain and you're not able to kind of to cash, uh, to cash on this. And also the other big element into it is like, Really, it's, it's, it's important to look at your profit margins, not to just do so many things. You have revenue, but then your profits are kind of dwindling in the process. Uh, that came about is actually because, actually it's out of necessity. I've never been in the activist space, but when the war started in South Sudan, I, I'm kind of like, I've been personally affected by it. And as such, I wanted to find communities that do work around that. And um, the founder of Defy Head now bumped into me in Nairobi, out of all places. I, was, I used to hang out with a hacker community, tech hacker community at the iHub. And he came and found me there and he was like, hey, we're doing this thing in South Sudan. And I was like, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. Because Defy Head now had aspect of peace building and IT. So I, I joined the program as a, as a trainer and a digital media um, uh, a specialist and and by that time I had also already engaged in another program by the United States Institute of Peace on young leaders and peace building so I had I have my IT training but then I engage more in ICT in, in peace building trainings 
So if I found, over time, I found myself in this vocal area where I have a piece building uh, skills and I also have a, piece, uh, a bit of a, a tech skills. And that really helped me fit well with Defy Head now. With the piece building skills, I, 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 through the United States Institute of Peace, I was able to train, I was able to get training on conflict resolution, communication skills, sensitive uh, communication, how to deal with, with peace building, uh, understanding prejudice. And that training led me to a lot of places. I trained people in Uganda, I, in Tanzania. Um, I even trained youth in Southeast Asia. Um, so I went to, this South, I think South, I went to Thailand and trained youth from a lot of countries. Afghanistan, Pakistan, over nine countries. Uh, uh, Myanmar, name them. So I had a lot of skills and that I brought that into Defy Head now. So as I, after I did my digital media thing, I took a role in Defy Head now, um, a role of programs, which basically means designing things that can kind of like help in programming our, 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 um, our interventions. So through that, I was able to bring a lot of tech into the initiative, um, like even in South Sudan, initiating our fact-checking uh, platforms, working on our digital media trainings. Like in 2018, for example, I did social media and peace building trainings in like three, in, in four countries in a period of like two months, in Kenya, Uganda, uh, South Sudan and Sudan. So that really kind of like push the initiative into different areas. Um, and since the, since the start of 2019, I, I took a role as the director of, South, of the South Sudan program, which is the initiative, which is the initial program, and also do, took a supportive role in supporting our Cameroon program and our program in Ethiopia. Both of which I, I was, I had to go at the, at the first training, at the first inception training in Cameroon, uh, I remember we did this four days training and I could not speak French and 80% of the audience uh, are French speaking. So it's like a really a challenging venture. Uh, but the thing that I found with Defy Head now, what I brought in and what I find my contribution there is to, to really push in a voice that can speak both to the tech part of the things, that's our partnerships with Facebook and with other uh, players, uh, data for change and the rest, but also like on the peace building and the youth engagement thing. Um, in a very weird way, my youthfulness actually happened to be beneficial in the, when I'm in Defy Head now. Because when I speak about technology uh, and I speak about social media, unlike other places, um, here old age at times is also associated with lack of information in this city. So my youthfulness actually worked well for me because I could relate with the youth that we're engaging with and I could relate with our partners. Defy Head now primarily works on enhancing trust and the mechanism for trust in the society. Um, so when you look at the vices that we face right now in society, in terms of digital media and incitement, to, so we look at incitement to violence, hate speech, disinformation, misinformation, um, and, uh, and, uh, and conflict and abuse of, of digital platforms, whether that is bullying, cyberbullying, uh, gender-related uh, attacks and stuff like that. So if I had now we kind of look at this, we like say like, hey, how can we create trust between various entities so as to enhance uh, online public discourse? That's the, that's the overall premise with the, with the vision of lasting peace between communities. Now, if, when you look at that as the overarching aim, that now leads you into like, how do you do that? Uh, so how do, you, how do you create trust? So, then we work on mitigating hate speech. So we tell people about the impact of hate speech. We tell people about the impact of incitement to violence. And we tell people how to mitigate it, both as individuals, but also as organizations. Then we work on tackling misinformation and disinformation. So we have a lot of programs on that with journalists, content creators, and the rest. And then we have elements of digital rights and, uh, and access to information. Because what happens is that like lack of information creates a vacuum for people now to, uh, if you deprive people from access to information, they are more likely to engage in misinformation. So we kind of like, how do we enhance, how do you incentivize avenues? That's actually what the work that at times we do with Facebook or the rest, like how do you incentivize avenues for people to access information? Um, and you find that in countries where you're operating, governments are economical with the information, or governments are manipulative with the information. 
and you find also with several other actors. So a lot of our programs focus on, like right now in Cameroon, we have a fellowship that's called the Africa Fact Checking Fellowship. Uh, I'll actually be joining them on a webinar later today. It's a three month program for journalists where we spend these three months taking them through like both traditional journalists and also content creators. Uh, traditional journalists usually they want to come and understand this new this information disorder ecosystem. So in this, throughout these three months you're taking, you're, you're basically taken through the various process like how to verify information on Twitter, on Facebook, um, how to understand viral, virality of content and how that impacts and stuff like that. And then we have other programs also targeted to the youth. Yeah, it's tough. So, so the, these are the kind of the range of intervention. And, and we are in, in five countries right now. We are in Ethiopia, we are in Cameroon, we are in Sudan, we are in South Sudan, and we are also um, in Kenya.